Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world, and happy Easter. I've been back from Africa for two weeks now, so I wanted to give you guys a review and a recap of what it was like hiking to Africa's tallest peak, Mount Kilimanjaro. It was a challenging and amazing experience, and I'm really excited to tell you guys all about it. So I hiked the Machame route. Uh, it took seven days to get to the summit and back down. And to give you guys just some information about Kilimanjaro, <clears throat> it is 19,341 feet at the peak. It's one of the most symmetrical volcanoes in the world. And it's the tallest freestanding mountain in the world. So the difference between that and like Everest, Everest is part of a mountain range. So there's a ton of other like peaks. Kilimanjaro actually stands completely by itself. And it's a pretty amazing and spectacular thing to see. Obviously I went in March because I hiked the first week of March. I've been home for two weeks, as I said. Uh, it's just at the touch beginning of the rainy season. Uh, the rainy season's actually been shifting kind of sooner in that part of Tanzania. So the rains came a lot while we were climbing and there was definitely snow at the top. So it was just an amazing, amazing experience all in all. So the mountain is pretty incredible because there's all these different ecosystems that you walk through from rainforest to moorland to desert, alpine desert, and then snow at the top. So it's almost like you're hiking through every season and every different ecosystem throughout the world all, all throughout a week. So it's pretty crazy just the experience that you have, the different plant life and animal life and all the different things that you see along the route as you make your way to the summit. So I went with a group called Eco Africa. They are a tour organization in Moshi, which is the basically like the hub for people that are hiking Mount Kilimanjaro. It's a really small town. It's super cute. And the company is great because they work with an organization called KPAP, so, which is called the Kilimanjaro Porters Assistant Program. They make sure that the porters and guides that are there on the mountain with you are actually getting a fair and equ equitable wage and also that they're not carrying too much weight. So it used to be on the mountain a long time ago that Porters, there was no weight restriction, so sometimes they'd be hiking up the mountain with extremely heavy packs and just like way more than a person should have to carry. So it's important to choose a group that is associated with this organization because it's important that you're supporting a company that pays people an equitable and living wage. So our seven-day route, well, and to tell you also, there's actually six routes up the mountain um, that go pretty much like from all different directions. There's actually one route that also comes from the Kenya side and then climbs up and then you end up in Tanzania on the other side. So it's pretty cool. But we took the Machame route. It has a lot of acclimation days. So it's actually one of the more successful routes up the mountain. And you go through some absolutely beautiful terrain with all these different ecosystems. So our first day, I'll just start with that, um, as we get to the gate at the Machame gate, we had a quick lunch and I had five other women that joined me on this hike. So that was also a pretty incredible experience is who you get to climb with. So we headed off around 1 p.m. from the gate after all of our porters and guides kind of got like weighed in and registered us and got us all ready for the next couple of days. And just to tell you, we actually had 25 porters and guides with us for six people. So you have a huge team of people that help you in ascending the mountain. They set up camp for you. They feed you. Uh, we had our own private bathrooms at camp also, which I'll get into all the camp stuff um, in a few minutes here. But so our first day on the mountain we hiked in the rainforest and there was monkeys and mice and all kinds of critters, lots of birds, some beautiful plants, some that I recognized, some that I didn't. There was lots of raspberry bushes along the trail. 
and um, wild carrots that I noticed also. And then there were some other species as well, like um, this little orange plant called the elephant trunk that was really pretty, that was all along the trail. And the really cool thing in the rainforest, which you guys will see when I um, publish my video that's gonna come out about this hike, because obviously I shot all the way along up the mountain. So that will be out in a few weeks. But I wanted to talk to you guys about it before I put that out. So the rainforest is just beautiful. Like there's like green moss covering all of the trees. Uh, it was just like so beautiful. And I can't wait to share that all with you guys in a couple of weeks when I put the video out. So hiking through the rainforest was just beautiful. It was warm and humid. Um, and I really enjoyed it. So we got to camp right before dark, um, our first base camp. Our porters and guides had already set everything up for us, all of our tents and everything. So when I got there, some of the other girls had gotten there before me because I was shooting along the way. And we had hot popcorn and cookies and tea when we arrived. And that was just a, a really welcome treat. Uh, that night, our first night in camp, it rained. Uh, but luckily we were nice and dry in our tents. So that was, that was good to hear or good to experience, I should say. Um, and that day we hiked about, uh, I believe 11 kilometers. So it was a pretty long hike the first day. Um, and we gained about 3000 feet in elevation. Now the next day it actually rained a good portion of the day, like off and on, um, showers. And we went now from rainforest into the moorland. So it's, like lower scrub brushes, um, more mossy covered rocks um, and unique like looking plants like thistle and um, some other kind of cool flowering plants. And the, and the great thing about the second day was that with the rains came all these like waterfalls that were rushing down the sides of the mountain and it was just absolutely beautiful. The second day is also when you, you reach about 10,000 feet, which is where a lot of people start feeling the effects of the altitude. So when we got to camp the second day, there was definitely some people that were feeling, you know, a little bit on the, uh, you know, they were feeling the effects of less oxygen for sure. And even me, like when we got to that second camp, I tried to walk around a little bit or like run around, I should say. And it was definitely a lot more challenging than it was at the bottom. So that day was a little bit more difficult at camp for sure. And we were supposed to actually do a second hike when we got to camp that day, but the weather didn't really work out. So, and that would have been an acclimation hike just to test our ability in the altitude. But so we just hung out at camp and it was great. We actually were introduced formally, I should say, to all of our porters and guides. And we sang and danced and it was really fun, which you guys will see in the video when it comes out. So day three, you hike into the Alpine desert. So it's like all these big boulders and rocks and you can really see the volcanic history there and all the like geology that from these volcanoes. So Kilimanjaro is actually three volcanoes and each peak is its own volcano. So we were going to summit on Kibo, Kibo, which is the tallest of the three volcanoes. Where we had camped the previous night was the Shira Plateau. And this used to be a really tall part of the volcano, but it actually erupted about 300 years ago and it blew the top off. So now it's a plateau and there's some caves there as well. So we hiked along there and then higher up into the altitude that day. And we reached lava tower, which is at 4,600 meters. So it's really, really high. And that day we got into the snow. So the hiking was definitely challenging at the end of the day that day. And that, that, that day was also an acclimation day. So you hike up to 4,600 and then you hike back down to 3,900 for camp. And that day for me was really hard when I got to camp. So we had lunch at Lava Tower, which is at the higher elevation. I felt fine. And then you hike back down 
for camp. And when I got back to camp, I definitely was feeling the effects of the altitude for sure. Um, it was definitely like I was lightheaded, my stomach kind of hurt. So that day for me was probably the hardest. And that day for that day is like the make or break day. So if you can get through that day, you are most likely going to make it to the summit. But I know there was definitely some people in other tour groups that did not make it to Lava Tower that day and had to turn back and or were, you know, had to get rescued off the mountain because it's very challenging hiking. Also, there's a lot of rocks. It's a lot of climbing up and down and it can be really challenging if you have like bad knees or just aren't as physically fit as you maybe should be for climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. It's not something that everyone should try. Definitely not. And uh, you definitely have to be in peak physical condition to climb it and be successful and not, you know, injure yourself. So that day was a challenging day, but camp was phenomenal. And I can't wait to show the videos to you guys because when we got to camp that evening, the fog was just rolling in over the edge of the mountain. And it was like mysterious and magical. And yeah, I'm really excited to share those videos with you guys. And um, I took a lot of rest that night just so I could feel better. And our cooks were amazing. I mean, we had like fresh soup every night and just like fantastic food. Potatoes are really popular in Tanzania. There's a lot of farmers there. Agriculture is huge. So they grow a lot of vegetables and potatoes. So almost every night we had either like French fries or some sort of delicious rice. But I have to say that the cook that we had was just so good. And I had heard from other people going into this climb that they were sick of eating the same thing every night after getting off the mountain, but I couldn't have a more different opinion of our chef that we had because he was just fantastic. And we raved about the food every morning, afternoon, and evening. So the next day when we left our camp, we were going to be climbing what's called the Barranco Wall. And it is literally a wall. So you have to literally like climb with your backpack and there's all the porters are with you and they've got like just tons of stuff. Uh, I see, um, I've got a question here. Um, someone is asking if I came from the Kenyan side. No, I did not. We actually came from the Tanzanian side from the Machame gate. So that's the route that we did. It was the Machame route. Um, I, I haven't heard a lot about the hike from the Kenya side, uh, but I know that most of our porters and guides said that their favorite route was the Lomosho route, which is on the Tanzanian side as well. Uh, but I want to get back to the Barranco wall. So this day was really challenging for some of the women that were with us because it was really, really steep. And one of our, ladies that was with our group has a little bit of vertigo. And so hiking something or climbing something where you're basically scrambling was a little bit challenging for some of us. And when we finally reached the top of that section, it was quite a relief and it was kind of sprinkling and, you know, there was a lot of people. So that was a challenging day. And then we had a, another like four or five kilometers to hike after that. So that was a really challenging day, but that took us to base camp for the summit. And that was a pretty exciting moment reaching that camp. And that was the first time we actually could see in a great view, the actual summit and also Mwenzi Peak, which is the other volcano um, that makes up Mount Kilimanjaro. And Mwenzi Peak is actually not climbed that often um, you have to be a pretty technical um, rock climber mountaineer to be able to reach the top of that one. So it's not climbed as often, uh, especially at the time of the year that we went because there is a lot of snow and it can be pretty challenging. So, but at base camp, we had a lot of time to rest. Um, 
that night we were actually going to leave for the summit of Kibo Peak. And so we got there around two o'clock. We had about two hours to rest. And then, and we had like a small snack when we got in. And then we took a short nap. And then we were woken up for dinner around six. We had a light dinner. And then we're supposed to sleep from seven to 10 p.m., which I could not sleep <laughs> at all. So I just laid there kind of tossing and turning until it was time to get up. And then at 10, we were woken up, 10 p.m., and we had some tea. And then we headed off to start our trek to the summit at 11 p.m. at night. Now, the summit day is really long, and it's really challenging. You're going up about 4,000 feet in elevation gain in one day, which is a lot by any standards, even for just a any hike, really. I mean, especially here in Los Angeles, that's like, you know, the tallest mountain that you could possibly climb. So it's a, it's a, it's a challenge. Even if you weren't already at 15,000 feet. So we started off in the night, everyone's got their headlamps and within about an hour, you can look back and just see all these little dots of lights ascending up the mountain. Um, and it was clear out, so we could see just like an incredible amount of stars, which was pretty, pretty amazing. Now, we were above the snow line at this point. At camp, we were above the snow line. So the whole way, we were hiking in the snow. And this isn't typical all year round, but because it had been raining at lower elevations, the higher elevations absolutely had snow. And I know I've talked to some people that have hiked in different months and this isn't always the case. So sometimes there's only snow at the peak and not um, all of the, all of the way up from 15,000 feet, but that was not the case for us. So it was definitely really challenging, not only just being in the snow, but it's really steep. So it was really hard and I am so thankful that we had the porters and guides with us because they helped pretty much all of us carry our backpacks. After like two hours, I was like, I cannot carry this thing. It was just crushing me because I was trying to carry my camera and my tripod and it was just way too much at that elevation. And like, I consider myself a pretty fit person, but it was really hard. And I would encourage all of you that are watching this to definitely try and climb Mount Kilimanjaro because for me, it was not only physically demanding, but it was emotionally demanding. And it's hard to explain kind of what you go through on that day, on the summit day from just the physical demanding part. You're, it's emotionally demanding. It's, it's nighttime. Um, you really learn to rely on the support of the people that are with you and feed off their encouragement. And I think that without the guides that we were with and just like how helpful they were, how nice they were, there's no way that I would have made it all the way to the top. And also I want to note that a lot of people take um, acclimation medicine. Um, I decided not to do that. I think for two reasons. I think one, I just wanted to see if I could climb to the top without it and see if my own body, like physically and mentally could rise to that challenge. So I think that was the main reason why I didn't want to take the altitude medicine. Now, I think you're definitely more successful if you do take it, but everyone's different. And I know for me that I just didn't want to rely on something other than my own abilities. But I know that a lot of other people that hike Kilimanjaro do take it. And I definitely would say if if someone was asking a recommendation on that, I would just say, you know, consult your physician and figure out what would work best for you as far as that goes. But so let me talk to you about 
the summit. So before you get to the summit, you reach a point called Stella Point. And this is the second highest point on the mountain. And when I got there, I was just like almost just like emotionally kaput. But luckily, um, my guide that I was with, Nazari, he gave me some tea. He gave me some crackers and he was like, you can do it. We're going to get there together. And he helped me get to the summit, to Uhuru Peak, the tallest point in Africa, the one of the seven summits, 19,341 feet. And the other women that I was with, we all met there at the summit on International Women's Day. And it was an incredible feeling. And I think it was probably for me the biggest challenge I've ever had in my life. So getting to the summit was just an absolutely incredible feeling. Now there is one of the routes you can take, actually, I think almost all the routes, but there's actually a huge glacier at the top of the mountain. And it's utterly just beautiful. I can't wait to share the video of uh, that area with you guys. But there's actually a couple of the routes that you can add on a day and you can actually camp on the glacier, which we did not do. Um, it would definitely be really cold, but I think if you're interested in that, um, that's definitely something if you do want to climb Kilimanjaro that you could add on to any of the different routes up the mountain. And then you can explore the glacier the, the day before that you summit and it would be a really, really um, interesting and um, unique experience as I don't think very many people do that because it's pretty cold up there at the top. So, but so also we got to the summit around, I think I got to the summit around 8 a.m. And I know one of the other girls that was with us is like a, a phenom and she got there like right when the sun came up. She was amazing. And uh, so I give her lots of props because I definitely was not as fast as she was. But in any case, it was it was great getting to the summit. And then we started the climb down and we went back to the base camp that we had started at um, earlier that night. That was a challenge too, getting back down um, on all the loose rock and snow. And a lot of the years it's, or a lot of the, the year, I should say, there's not snow there. So you can kind of slide down all the scree and you get back to camp and you have a lunch and then you actually have to keep climbing down to another camp and spend the night. And then the next day you get down to the bottom. So were there any scary moments? There were no avalanches. No. Um, so, oh, and just for any of you that are watching this afterwards, I just got a question asking if there were any scary moments, missteps, slips, falls, avalanches. There were definitely no avalanches. Um, definitely some scary moments on the Bronco wall just because of the steepness. And a lot of us had pretty heavy backpacks. So climbing up something where you're scrambling with a big backpack can sometimes be uh, really scary, especially when you think you're going to like maybe fall over backwards and just like totally eat it. Um, and I think the other scary moments are just dealing with the altitude because your body, like you just don't expect, I guess, to feel like out of, so out of breath sometimes. So that can be a pretty scary moment too, just like dealing with your own physical difficulties. <laughs> but um, after we got done with the climb and got back down to the camp that we were going to be at for our last night, we had a fantastic dinner with all of our guides and they actually, our chef made us a cake, which was really cool. And, uh, yeah, the next day we got down to the bottom and we thanked all our porters and guides and it was amazing. It was just a great thing. And I, I'd like to definitely recommend climbing Mount Kilimanjaro to anyone. 
Um, you definitely have to be in really good shape. How many calories did I burn per day? Ooh, I don't know. Definitely. Like I think at least three or 4,000. I know they definitely fed us a lot. And in total we hiked 45 miles from start to finish. So, and every day you're hiking somewhere between uh, four and eight miles. It just kind of depends on the day. So you're definitely hiking a lot and the altitude, you burn more calories, obviously. And so the thing that they're always telling you to do is eat, 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 and then obviously drink a lot of water and stay rested. So those are all things that you have to do a lot of. Let's see. There's some other questions here. Uh, how long did I stay at the top? So at the top of the mountain, you're actually, they actually try to just get you off the mountain as quickly as possible. I think for a couple reasons, but so at the actual top, I think I was probably there for just about 20 minutes before we headed back down. Um, not only is it just really hard to breathe up there. So the oxygen level at the top is 9%. And I think normal oxygen level is 16%. So it's almost half, it's less, almost less than half of what you can normally breathe like at sea level. So it's, it's really hard to breathe up there. So they try and get you off the mountain as quickly as possible. Let's see, here we go. Um, so you must work out regularly. Um, I, yeah, definitely. So someone is asking, the real estate whisperer is asking if, if I work out regularly and if I think a person that doesn't would be able to make it to the top. Yeah, I do work out regularly. And um, on my website, I actually have a three month training guide for climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. Definitely, if you are going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro, you have to train. It is an absolute necessity. You can't just wing it and give it a go. You definitely need to train for at least three months and you need to be able to run somewhere between three and five miles without stopping in order to probably have a chance of making it to the top. I would say that most of the days up until the summit day were not super physically demanding on like, like my legs weren't sore. I wasn't, I wasn't sore from hiking. It was just the altitude that got me, but definitely I saw some people that weren't in good physical condition and they were having a really hard time. Um, it's definitely important to train and it's a, it's a definite necessity. Uh, someone else is asking if I lost weight on the climb. Um, I don't think I did lose any weight. I think, you know, they feed you so much on the mountain. For breakfast, we would have like pancakes, eggs, toast, oatmeal, plenty of coffee. And then lunch were soup and always like three or four different options. Um, and same for dinner. So lots to eat and lots to drink. Um, so I definitely didn't lose any weight, but I thought I might like going into it. But yeah, it didn't happen. Um, someone else asked if there were restrooms. Yes. Yeah, so at all of our camps, we had one of the great things I should say about our tour company was that they provided us with private bathrooms. So we had a private bathroom at all of our camps and there were like porta potties as well at the camps. Now along the trail, there are not bathrooms. Um, so you just kind of have to, you know, pop a squat <laughs> in the woods or behind a rock or whatever, um, which was fine because I think most of us that hike a lot do that anyways. I just have one more comment here. Um, yeah, so Real Estate Whisper is saying um, that she likes weightlifting, but not running. So, yeah, there are other options if you don't like running. Uh, definitely, I don't know if you live somewhere that's near any hiking. But if you can hike, you know, like 10, 10 miles without killing yourself, there's another option. Or swimming is a great way. But anything that keeps you cardiovascularly fit is great. Now, you also need to mix in weight training with any sort of cardio work that you're doing in order to be fit enough to climb Kilimanjaro. Uh, someone else is asking, Pine Creek is asking, has anyone died on the mountain before? 
Yeah, I think there have been some deaths over the years. Now, obviously nobody died when I was on the mountain, um, but altitude sickness is, uh, mountain altitude sickness is definitely a real sickness. It does affect a lot of people and it definitely can be life-threatening. Absolutely. And there are definitely companies out there that do not check for your health and well-being, and you can get something called pulmonary edema, and that can kill you. Um, our guides actually checked our blood oxygen level and our pulse every night and every morning to make sure that we were acclimating. And if you have a blood oxygen level lower than 80, you are supposed to be taken down to lower elevation. Now, not every company does this. And I think that it's really important to pick one if you are going to do this climb that checks your blood oxygen level because there are people that had a lower than 80 and they had to go back, not from our group, but I know from some other groups. And if, if people aren't checking that and you continue to climb and your oxygen level was below 80, it could have serious life threatening um, issues from that. So it's important to go with someone that's checking those levels for you. And then let's see. Let me just see these other questions here. Um, yeah, so if you live in a, also if you live in an area where there isn't places to hike, uh, some other things that you can do to get in shape are swimming, or you could go on the elliptical, you can do the Stairmaster. So there's some other things that you can do, but definitely um, I would say going somewhere where you can do some altitude training is good. I don't think I have it here within my reach, but I also have uh, this altitude mask. It's called a peak resistance mask. You can put it on and it actually simulates altitude. So it kind of like restricts how much oxygen you have. So you can wear it like weight training or doing any sort of cardio exercise or walking. And it will take the normal oxygen and like reduce how much air you can breathe. So that was a good thing for me. And I think I have like a little, I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is like just like the card from it because I don't have it here in the office with me, but it's just like a mask that goes over your face that, can reduce the amount of oxygen that you breathe. So that was a good training device for me too, because here in Los Angeles, the mountains aren't that high. So it was hard for me to do altitude training here as well. And then someone else was asking how much it cost to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. The company that I went with for the whole trip, and that includes pretty much all of your meals for all of the days, and a pre and post hotel night with breakfast came to about $2,600. Now there are other companies out there that charge a little bit more, some charge a little bit less, um, but that's a pretty average price, pretty medium in there. And um, that includes like all your porters obviously and your guides and your assistant guides and transportation and airport pickup and all that stuff. So pretty much everything is included in that price. And for anyone that's interested, um, my company, Travganic, actually um, has more bookings for climbing Kilimanjaro in the summer. And also next year, if you want to go on a women's only trip, we have some openings for that. And we also have, you know, we can set up anyone that wants to go in their own group or join a group, men, women, whoever. Um, and the price is around, it depends on which route you take as well. But usually around between 26 and 3,200 um, for everything. So ex except for airfare, it's not included. And then one other question here is, is there anything you would bring or do differently if I went again? Well, actually that brings up a good point because I would love to talk to you guys about like the things that were absolutely ne necessities, I think that I needed, like baby wipes were like so important. Um, Having like a little chamois towel, a poncho, super important because um, it definitely rained a lot. And then you're going through all these different ecosystems. So you have to pack like a little bit of everything. 
And one of the other great things about the tour company that we went with is that they actually checked out all of our equipment before we headed off for the mountain to make sure like, okay, do you have gloves? Do you have, do you have like really warm gloves and not so warm gloves for like all the different temperatures? Do you have snow pants? Do you have hiking poles? Um, so that was really important to make sure that we were all like properly equipped. But I think definitely the things that you like absolutely have to have are sunglasses, a poncho, waterproof boots um, are really important because we were definitely walking in like wet conditions. And then I actually have like winter hiking boots. My feet tend to get really cold. So that was really important for me. And hand warmers. I had like 15 packs of those, the little hot pocket things which on summit night were definitely invaluable because it was freezing. And then I've got some other questions here. Um, yes, David is asking if there's gonna be a video later. Absolutely, there's gonna be a video later. I have uh, two more videos to put out before I get to Kilimanjaro, but it should be out hopefully in the next month, I'm hoping, but I wanted to do this video beforehand just because I know it's probably going to be a couple weeks before I get the video out to you guys. So I wanted to just answer any questions anyone had and, and kind of give you my firsthand experience of what it was like, but yes, there will definitely be a video out and hopefully very soon. And then Pine Creek's asking, Oh yeah, it's only 3000. I know it's uh it's not that much money really for everything that you get. And after we climbed Two of the girls um, and I actually went on a safari, so which is another experience that I'll share in a different video, but that was incredible also. Um, Achan, hi Alvin, by the way, is asking, um, what were all the different climate and weather changes that, that I went through? So you hike through five different ecosystems. You go from rainforest to moorland to alpine desert to well, I think high mountain desert and then you get to the glacier at the top so you go basically from this hot humid conditions like to 15 degrees Fahrenheit at the top so it's like this like whirlwind of like hey we just hiked from you know the north pole to the equator uh we went from hot and humid we had rain we had just like almost every weather pattern too like near the top once we hit past the um snow line there was snow obviously one day we had like sleet um and hail on the way down one of the days um sometimes it was sunny and beautiful several of the mornings we had beautiful rainbows uh, so yeah, pretty much like every weather pattern. And that's, that's not always the same throughout the year, but because the rainy season started a little bit early this year, we did get a lot of rain and at night. So yeah, but uh, it was just absolutely incredible. <laughs> and, I'm uh, just reading some last questions here, but yeah. So if you guys have any other questions, um, let me know because I'm probably going to be ending the video here in just a second. But, um, Oh, someone is asking a side question. Uh, best national park in the Southwest U S for a family with two young teens. Um, let's see. Uh, that's a good question. I love Sequoia national park not Sequoia. Wait, is that correct? Uh, the one in Tucson, um, I don't know why I'm blanking right now. <laughs> um, but Tucson has some great national parks in Arizona. Um, if you want to go a little bit higher than that, I know Utah is like sort of the Southwest, but not really, but Moab is amazing. Um, Death Valley here in California. I love it. I think that one's great for, for teenagers as well. You've got Rhyolite, the ghost town there, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then, let me see here. Sorry, guys, just reading some of these questions. Sora, yes, thank you. Sora National Park, that's the one in, in um, Arizona. I love that one. There's a lot to do in Tucson. 
Um, if you do decide to go to Sora National Park, I could give you a ton of recommendations on restaurants and other things to do in that area. There's like caves you can go spelunking in. There's an airplane park that has all kinds of old uh, retired airplanes from the military and non-military. So there's just like a lot to do in that area if you do go there. Oh, well, fabulous. You already know then. Um, well, if you want to get out of Arizona then, um, I don't know, have you ever been to Gila River National Forest in New Mexico? That's a great one also um, over in that area. But if you come to California, you know, we've got some fantastic national parks. Joshua Tree is great. Um, and Death Valley, as I said. So if you come this way, those are some great ones as well to visit. Um, just reading some more of these. But yeah, so I'm just going to end this video by saying Happy Easter to everyone. Thank you to all of you that joined me today in this live video. And if you have any other questions about Kilimanjaro, please reach out to me. You can email me. You can comment on this video. Or you can visit my website, alicesadventuresonearth.com, and reach me via that, or reach out to me on social media. I'm on Twitter at Alice L. Ford, and I'm on Instagram at Alice's Adventures on Earth. So come and chat with me, ask you, me anything that you want. And if you are interested in booking a trip to Kilimanjaro, you can reach out to me on any of those, or you can visit my um, ecotourism website, travganic.com. And we've got all the information that you might need on climbing Kilimanjaro and any other ecotourism tours. I've got hotels on there too. So if you're interested in staying in an eco hotel or a sustainable lodge glamping anywhere around the world, um, we've got all that on there for you too. So thanks so much for watching guys. And, um, up soon is going to be uh, my adventures in Belize and Guatemala and then uh, Kilimanjaro. So I'm excited to share that all with you and uh, have a great Sunday, everyone. I will see you all soon.